if it's too late. Too late. Too late. What if I waited too long to, to change things, change me? What if I waited too long? Get a grip on it, would you, Alex? You're not the only one here, you know? For starters, you never changed anything. You're a Christian, right? So who do you believe in? A time of trouble, such as the Earth has never seen or known, is just ahead of us. Are we ready for it? Are we prepared? Have we placed our trust in Christ? And do we believe in Him as the Savior of our souls? Nothing else will soon matter. Every man, woman, and child must stand before God as if there were no other. In this time of trouble, Satan, the enemy of Christ and man, will then accuse God's children on account of their sins, and the Lord will permit the enemy to try them to the uttermost. Their confidence in God, their faith and firmness will be severely tested. As they review the past, their hopes will sink, for in their whole lives, they will see little good. This is a living hell, and I don't think I'm gonna make it. Wait, please don't leave. What's good enough? Are you good enough? Am I good enough? When did you become your own God, Lisa? Your own savior? At that time, God's people will be fully conscious of their weakness and unworthiness. Satan will endeavor to terrify them with the thought that their cases are hopeless, that the stain of their defilement will never be washed away. Satan's one hope will be to destroy their faith in Christ so that they will yield to his temptations and turn from their allegiance to God. Many are the stories that will be told in the pages of eternity. I should have listened to them. Listen to who? My parents. He told me that this was gonna happen. He said it was prophesied, you know, in the Bible. I grew up listening to it in church, church school, morning and evening worship with my family. I never really believed it. At least I didn't want to believe it. From the very beginning of the Great Controversy, which was a war in heaven, it has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. It was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the Creator. And though he was cast out of heaven, he has continued the same warfare upon the earth. To deceive men and thus lead them to transgress God's law is the object which he has steadfastly pursued. Whether this be accomplished by casting aside the law altogether or by rejecting one of its precepts, the result will be ultimately the same. He that offends in one point manifests contempt for the whole law. His influence and example are on the side of transgression. He becomes guilty of all. The Bible is within the reach of all, but there are few who really accept it as the guide of life. But in the time of trouble, while God's people are surrounded by enemies who are bent upon their destruction, the anguish which they suffer will not be a dread of persecution for the truth's sake. They will fear that every sin has not been repented of and that through some fault in themselves, they will fail to realize the fulfillment of the Savior's promise. I will keep them from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world. If they could have the assurance of pardon, they would not shrink from torture or death. But should they prove unworthy and lose their lives because of their own defects of character, then God's holy name would be reproached. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand. But it will not come. Please. Read it to us, too. We need it, too. Okay. We're all wondering if we're going to make it. Please. Okay. It says 
Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the time of trouble ahead of us, if the people of God have unconfessed sins to appear before them while tortured with fear and anguish, they will be overwhelmed. Despair will cut off their faith, and they will not have confidence to plead with God for deliverance. Satan leads many to believe that God will overlook their unfaithfulness in the minor affairs of life. But all who endeavor to excuse or conceal their sins and permit them to remain upon the books of heaven unconfessed and unforgiven, will be overcome by Satan. Those who come up to the last fearful conflict unprepared will, in their despair, confess their sins in words of burning anguish, but their confession will be of the same character as was that of Judas. They will lament the result of transgression, but not its guilt. But God's love for his children during this period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity. Many Christians have suffered in prison cells for Christ in times past, and so they will again in the future. Have it your way. The hard way. into months. Please tell me it won't be years. I don't know how much longer I can hold on. I don't know how much longer I can hold on. It's 240. Yes, indeed. The season of distress and anguish before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger. A faith that will not faint, though severely tried. All who will lay hold of God's promises will not be disappointed. But those who are unwilling to deny self, to agonize before God, to pray long and earnestly for His blessing, will not obtain it. Wrestling with God, how few know what it is. Those who exercise but little faith now are in the greatest danger of falling under the power of satanic delusions. And even if they endure the test, they will be plunged into deeper distress and anguish in the time of trouble because they have never made it a habit to trust in God. The lessons of faith which they have neglected, they will be forced to learn under a terrible pressure of discouragement. Others who have learned to place their trust in the unmerited favor of Christ will lean on Him in faith and confidence. Daddy, why do we have to keep on looking? Why do we have to keep on looking? The city's not safe. We have to leave. I trust you, Daddy. Good job. I know, honey, I know, but we can't right now. We have to go on our adventure, remember? But Daddy, how will Jesus find us? Um, Jesus will find us because Jesus knows everywhere everyone is. He knows exactly where everybody is and he knows exactly what everybody's doing. He's watching us right now. In the sky? Yeah, in the sky, everywhere. 
Look at my face. You see how much I love you? Hmm? And you see how much I love you? You see exactly how much Jesus loves you. I love you that much, Daddy. <laughs> and I love you this much. I love you more. I love you more. But I love you this much. But that's not fair. Yes, it is fair. Because I love you first, I love you last, and I love you every bit in between. That's so sweet. You're so sweet too, but we have to go now, okay? Okay. The time of trouble such as never was is soon to be upon us, and we shall need an experience which we do not now possess and which many are too lazy to obtain. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. But this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. In that time of trial, every soul must stand for himself or herself before God. Prior to the close of human probation and before the time of trouble, there will be a group of people who hear the final warning message and accept the truths for this time. The Lord will have a people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. There will be some who, like the thief on the cross, may not know or understand all that other, more seasoned Christians have been privileged to know. Yet these eleventh hour workers will cling by their faith to their Savior. What makes you so strong, Jamie? I'm not strong. I just know who I believe in. I don't know how any of us are going to make it through this. I just know that he has brought me here this far. I believe. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior. It is in this life that we are to separate sin from us through faith in the atoning blood of Christ. Our precious Savior invites us to join ourselves to Him, to unite our weakness to His strength, our ignorance to His wisdom, our unworthiness to His merits. God's providence is the school in which we are to learn the meekness and lowliness of Jesus. The Lord is ever setting before us not the way we would choose, which seems easier and pleasanter to us, but the true aims of life. It rests with us to cooperate with the agencies of heaven. But even the favor of God does not exclude his people from suffering. Jesus warned his followers that before the crown, there will always be a cross. Christ clearly stated that if they have persecuted him, they will persecute his children also, saying, a servant is not greater than his master. Suffering for Christ is a trust that has been given throughout history, and this trust will continue to the close of time. As long as Satan exists, this enemy of God and humanity will work through his agencies to torment and afflict those whom God has chosen to be heirs of the kingdom of grace. Abide with me. Pass on the even tide. The darkness deepens. Part with me alive. When other helpers fail and comfort sleep, help all the helpless, Lord, Lord, abide with me. To his clothes, ebbs out life's 
little day. For if his joy is brought him, glory has away. Change and decay. And all around I see. But thou who changest not, abide with me. I need thy presence every waking hour. What but thy grace? Myself, my guide and stay can be through cloud and sunshine. Lord, abide with me. I fear no foe with the attempt to bless. Have no weight and tears, no bitterness. <laughs> Where is death sting? Where grave thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. <laughs> With sympathizing tenderness, angels witness the distress of God's people in the time of trouble, and heavenly guardians hear their prayers. But they are waiting the word of their commander to snatch them from their peril. But they must wait yet a little longer. The people of God must drink of the cup and be baptized with a baptism. This very delay, so painful to them, is the best answer to their petition. As they endeavor to wait trustingly for the Lord to work, they are led to exercise faith, hope, and patience, which have been too little exercised during their religious experience. Yet for the elect's sake, the time of trouble will be shortened. Why are we still here? Why did we survive when all the others are dead? Just say it, would you? They're all dead. What's wrong with you people? Get real, would you? You don't know that. You don't know if they're dead or alive. And that's the problem. None of us know who's dead and who's alive. They're dead. Our friends. Our family, they're all gone. You saw it with your own eyes. We all saw it. Everything was doubt. That is, everything after the earthquakes, tornadoes, everything else. And even if they survive, Radiation and the plagues would have got him anyway. I'm going back at daybreak. I'm going back. I said I would wait for him. And I didn't. Wait for who? For Jim. My husband. I 
said I'd wait for him. And I didn't. I just ran with everyone else. I just kept running and running. That's all I could do. I was so scared. And now I'm here. I don't even know where here is. Here is safe. That's where here is. And you should be thankful. God spared your life. How can I appreciate this? How can I be thankful in the middle of this? And what's life worth if everyone is gone anyway? This is my truth. I'm going back tomorrow. I'm headed straight for my apartment. You're all unbelievable. Your apartment's gone. It's all gone. You aren't the only one who left people behind. I left them all. My mother, my father, my brother. I don't know where anyone is. Regrets. That's all I have. Just a life of regrets. How can they forgive me? If I can't even forgive myself. So why don't you let God forgive you instead of you trying to forgive yourself? The people of God will not be free from suffering, but while persecuted and distressed, while they endure privation and suffering, they will not be left to perish. I, the Lord, will hear them. Do you see me? Do you hear me? See me? Hear me! The eye of God, looking down through the ages, was fixed upon the crisis which his people are to meet when earthly powers shall be arrayed against them. Like the captive exile, they will be in fear of death by starvation or by violence. But the Holy One will manifest his mighty power and turn their captivity. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. 
When the protection of human law shall be withdrawn from those who honor the law of God, there will be, in different lands, a simultaneous movement for their destruction. As the time appointed in the decree draws near, the people will conspire to root out the hated sect. It will be determined to strike in one night a decisive blow, which shall utterly silence the voice of dissent and reproof. The people of God, some in prison cells, some hidden in solitary retreats in the forest and the mountain, still plead for divine protection, while in every quarter companies of our men, urged on by hosts of evil angels, are preparing for the work of death. Light is gleaming upon the clouds above the mountaintops. Soon, there will be a revealing of His glory. The Son of Righteousness is about to shine forth, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. I, even I, am He that comforteth you. Who art thou, that thou shouldst be afraid of a man that shall die, and of the Son of Man which shall be made as grass, and forgettest the Lord thy Maker? Just shut up, would you? Everyone, just shut up! You're all a bunch of religious fanatics. How did I end up here with you? I never said I was Christian. I don't even want to be a Christian. What good's it done any of you? I only came here because there was nowhere else to go. But what's the point sitting in this freezing dark hole, waiting to die, listening to all of you worrying about God? I'm out of here. You're all crazy. Just a bunch of crazy people using religion as a crutch. It's not a crutch. He's real. God is real. We might be feeling guilty and lost, but that doesn't make God any less real. Whatever. Come on, Alex. Let's go. Let's leave this stinking, bad-infested hellhole. Let's leave these fools and survive. No. I'm staying. It may be dark in here. But I've seen more light than I ever have. I'm staying. Whatever. Wait, I'll go. I can't sit here and die. I left the chickens at the farm a long time ago. And I refuse to die with a bunch of chickens today. No, not you, Julie. You know it's true, everything they've been saying. It's the truth. I believe them. My mom was right. There is a heaven, and there is a hell. <laughs> As the wrestling ones urge their petitions before God, the veil separating them from the unseen will seem almost withdrawn. The heavens will soon glow with the dawning of eternal day. The precious Savior will send help just when it is needed. The way to heaven is consecrated by His footprints. Every thorn that wounds our feet has wounded His. Every cross that we are called to bear, He has borne before us. The Lord permits conflicts to prepare the soul for peace. Oh, 
you're here. I'm not afraid to die. It's not worthy of you. I never was. But you promised. I'll let you. Let your grace and your undeserved love is enough. I believe. I believe. Though a general decree has fixed the time when commandment keepers may be put to death, their enemies will in some cases anticipate the decree and before the time specified will endeavor to take their lives. But none can pass the mighty guardian stationed about every faithful soul. God will shield those fleeing from destruction and guide them to safety. He has promised, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Hey, there they are right there. Put that down. Hey. What are you doing? time of trouble, such as the earth has never seen or known, is just ahead of us. Are we ready for it? Are we prepared? Have we placed our trust in Christ, and do we believe in Him as the Savior of our souls? Nothing else will soon matter. 
Every man, woman, and child must stand before God as if there were no other. It is at midnight that God manifests his power for the deliverance of his people. The sun appears shining in his strength. Signs and wonders follow in quick succession. The righteous behold with solemn joy the tokens of their deliverance. Everything in nature seems turned out of its course. The streams cease to flow. Dark and heavy clouds come up and clash against each other. In the midst of the angry heavens is one clear space of indescribable glory. Whence comes the voice of God, like the sound of many waters, saying, It is done. That voice shakes the heavens and the earth. There is a mighty earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. The firmament appears to open and shut. The glory from the throne of God seems to be flashing through. The mountains shake like a reed in the wind, and ragged rocks are scattered on every side. There is a roar as of coming tempest. The sea is lashed into fury. There is heard the shriek of a hurricane like the voice of demons upon a mission of destruction. God's people, who have been held in bondage for their faith, are set free. At that time, graves will be opened, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. All who have died in the faith of the third angel's message come forth from the tomb glorified to hear God's covenant of peace with those who have kept his law. They also which pierced him, those that mocked and derided Christ's dying agonies and the most violent opposers of his truth and his people are raised to behold him in his glory and to see the honor placed upon the loyal and obedient. Thick clouds still cover the sky, yet the sun now and then breaks through, appearing like the avenging eye of Jehovah. Fierce lightnings leap from the heavens, enveloping the earth in a sheet of flame. Above the terrific roar of thunder, voices mysterious and awful declare the doom of the wicked. Said the prophets of old as they beheld in holy vision the day of God, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and to the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty and upon everyone that is lifted up and he shall be brought low. In that day, a man shall cast the idols of his silver and the idols of his gold, which they made each one for himself to worship. Cast them to the moles and to the bats to go into the clefts of the rock and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Through a rift in the clouds, there beams a star whose brilliancy is increased fourfold in contrast with the darkness. It speaks hope and joy to the faithful, but severity and wrath to the transgressors of God's law. The clouds sweep back, and the starry heavens are seen unspeakably glorious in contrast with the black and angry firmament on either side. The glory of the celestial city streams from the gates ajar. Then there appears against the sky a hand holding two tables of stone folded together. Says the prophet, the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. That holy law, God's righteousness, that amid thunder and flame was proclaimed from Sinai as the guide of life, is now revealed to men as the rule of judgment. In the lives of all who reject truth, there are moments when conscience awakens, when memory presents the torturing recollection of a life of hypocrisy, and the soul is harassed with vain regrets. But what are these compared with the remorse of that day when fear cometh as desolation, when destruction cometh as a whirlwind? The living righteous will then be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. When God speaks, they were glorified. And finally, they will be made immortal. And with the risen saints, will be caught up to meet their Lord in the air. Angels will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Little children are borne by holy angels to their mother's arms. Friends long separated by death are united, never more to part. And with songs of gladness, they will ascend together to the city of God. 
At the second coming of Christ, the wicked will be destroyed. Christ will take his people to the city of God as their savior and redeemer. At that time, the earth will be emptied of its inhabitants and the whole earth will have the appearance of a desolate wilderness. The ruins of cities and villages ravished by war will be all that is left. Uprooted trees, ragged rocks thrown out by the sea or torn out of the earth itself are scattered over its surface, while vast caverns mark the spot where the mountains have been rent from their foundations by the great earthquake at Christ's coming. The biblical book of Revelation foretells the banishment of Satan and the condition of chaos and desolation to which the earth is to be reduced. And he declares that this condition will exist for a thousand years. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. For 6,000 years, his prison house, the grave, received God's people, and he would have held them captive forever. But Christ, with great power and glory, broke his bonds and set the prisoners free. Even the wicked who are now dead and whose carcasses cover the earth are placed beyond the power of Satan. And alone with his evil angels, he remains to realize the effect of the curse which sin has brought. The prophecy of Isaiah states, the kings of the nations, even all of them lie in glory, every one in his own house, the grave. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. At the close of the thousand years, the second resurrection will take place. Then the wicked will be raised from the dead and appear before God for the execution of the judgment written. Thus the revelator, after describing the resurrection of the righteous, says, The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. And Isaiah declares concerning the wicked, They shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. But in the visions of the prophet, those who have triumphed over sin and the grave are seen happy in the presence of their maker, talking freely with him as man talked with God in the beginning. Be ye glad, the Lord bids them, and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her nor the voice of crying. The inhabitants shall not say, I am sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. In the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And an highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. Cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. At the close of the thousand years, Christ will again return to the earth. He will be accompanied by the host of the redeemed and attended by a retinue of angels. As he descends in terrific majesty, he bids the wicked dead arise to receive their doom. And they come forth, a mighty host, numberless as the sands of the sea. What a contrast to those who were raised at the first resurrection. The righteous were clothed with immortal youth and beauty. The wicked bear the traces of disease and death. Every eye in that vast multitude is turned to behold the glory of the Son of God. With one voice, the wicked host exclaim, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. It is not love to Jesus that inspires this utterance. The force of truth urges the words from unwilling lips. 
as the wicked went into their graves, so they come forth with the same enmity to Christ and the same spirit of rebellion. They are to have no new probation in which to remedy the defects of their past lives. Nothing would be gained by this. A lifetime of transgression has not softened their hearts. A second probation, were it given to them, would be occupied as was the first in evading the requirements of God and exciting rebellion against Him. Christ descends upon the Mount of Olives, from where, after His resurrection, He ascended, and where angels repeated the promise of His return, said the prophet, The Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, and there shall be a very great valley. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and His name one. As the New Jerusalem in its dazzling splendor comes down out of heaven, it rests upon the place purified and made ready to receive it. The evil dead that have been risen at Christ's return now view all that they have lost, and after one last vain attempt to overthrow the throne of God, they realize their defeat and in agony fall down before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, just as it was prophesied, every knee shall bow. Before the final destruction of the wicked takes place, a panoramic scene takes place in the heavens. The books of record are open, and the lost are made conscious of every sin which they have ever committed. The Savior's lowly birth appears, His public ministry unfolding to men heaven's most precious blessings, the days crowded with deeds of love and mercy, the plottings of envy, hate, and malice which repaid His benefits, the awful, mysterious agony in Gethsemane beneath the crushing weight of the sins of the whole world, his betrayal into the hands of the murderous mob, the unresisting prisoner forsaken by his best-loved disciples, rudely hurried to the judgment hall of Pilate, mocked, insulted, tortured, and condemned to die, all are vividly portrayed. And now, before the swaying multitude are revealed the final scenes, patient sufferer, treading the path to Calvary, the Prince of Heaven hanging upon the cross, the haughty priest and the jeering rabble deriding his expiring agony, the supernatural darkness, the heaving earth, the rent rocks, marking the moment when the world's Redeemer yielded up his life. The awful spectacle appears just as it was. Satan, his angels, and his subjects have no power to turn from the picture of their own work. They have none to plead their cause. They are without excuse, and the sentence of eternal death is pronounced against them. Finally, they are destroyed by the brightness and glory of God, never more to be. Evil has been cut off, root and branch. Satan the root, and his followers the branches. Satan's work of ruin is forever ended. For 6,000 years he has wrought his will, filling the earth with woe and causing grief throughout the universe. The whole creation has groaned and travailed together in pain. Now, God's creatures are forever delivered from his presence and temptations. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They, the righteous, break forth into singing a shout of praise and triumph ascends from the whole loyal universe. The voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a mighty thunderings is heard, saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. While the earth was wrapped in the fire of destruction, the righteous abode safely in the holy city. Upon those that had part in the first resurrection, the second death has no power. While God is to the wicked a consuming fire, he is to his people both a sun and a shield. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. The fire that consumes the wicked purifies the earth. Every trace of the curse is swept away. No eternally burning hell will keep before the ransomed the fearful consequences of sin. As the prophet beholds the redeemed dwelling in the city of God, free from sin and from all marks of the curse, in rapture he exclaims, 
Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation, and thy gates praise. Thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. One reminder alone remains. Our Redeemer will ever bear the marks of his crucifixion. Upon his wounded head, upon his side, his hands and feet are the only traces of the cruel work that sin has wrought. The prophet says, beholding Christ in his glory, he had bright beams coming out of his side, and there was the hiding of his power. That pure side where flowed the crimson stream that reconciled man to God, there is the Savior's glory, there the hiding of his power. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Christ assured his disciples that he went to prepare mansions for them in the Father's house. Those who accept the teachings of God's word will not be wholly ignorant concerning the heavenly abode. And yet, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. In the Bible, the inheritance of the saved is called a country. There the heavenly shepherd leads his flock to fountains of living waters. The tree of life yields its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the service and the healing of the nations. There are ever-flowing streams, clear as crystal, and beside them waving trees cast their shadows upon the paths prepared for the ransomed of the Lord. There, the wide-spreading plains swell into hills of beauty, and the mountains of God rear their lofty summits. On those peaceful plains, beside those living streams, God's people, so long pilgrims and wanderers, shall find a home. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, for the former things are passed away. The inhabitants shall not say, I am sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. The tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they, they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. Unfettered by mortality, they wing their tireless flight to worlds afar, worlds that thrilled with sorrow at the spectacle of human woe and rang with songs of gladness at the tidings of a ransomed soul. With unutterable delight, the children of earth enter into the joy and the wisdom of unfallen beings. They share the treasures of knowledge and understanding gained through ages upon ages in contemplation of God's handiwork. With undimmed vision, they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns and stars and systems, all in their appointed order, circling the throne of deity. Upon all things, from the least to the greatest, the Creator's name is written, and in all are the riches of His power displayed. And the years of eternity, as they roll, will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ. As knowledge is progressive, so will love, reverence, and happiness increase. The more men learn of God, the greater will be their admiration of His character. And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto Him that sitteth upon the throne, and under the Lamb forever and ever. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow light and life and gladness throughout the realms of unlimited space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love.